Neil Walker joins me for our 19th annual interview. Neil, thanks for taking the time once again. 19 years, unbelievable. Well, thanks for having me on again, Joe. It's, it's always a pleasure to talk to you this time of year. And yeah, 19 years is we're, we're creeping up to that 20 year mark. So it, it certainly brings a lot of perspective, brings back a lot of memories of my uh, days in Altoona and, and our first couple go rounds in the interview world. In this past October, your dad passed away. He was very influential in your life. Of course, he was a major league player. You've got to have some tremendous memories of your life with him. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, the, the thing that I remember the most he instilled in me along with my mom was just, you know, that resiliency. And from an early age, if you needed something or you wanted something, you were going to have to go and earn it. And I still say to this day, and I, and I tell a lot of youth kids and youth parents this, the one thing that I appreciated more than anything else is, you know, when I was in high school and growing up, I knew that I wanted to try to be the best baseball player I could be, whether that was a you know college or JUCO or major league or whatever. And, you know, I can remember that the my dad's stance on it was, okay, well, when you want to go hit or you want to go throw, you need to tell me. I'm not going to drag you to the practice field. I'm not going to drag you out in the front yard to play catch. If this is your dream, I will help you 100%, but you're going to have to take the reins and do the work. And I can, to this day, say that I never got worn out by baseball. I never got felt like I got tired of wanting to play, and that love for the game started at such an early age. Just constantly, we would talk about, especially as I got to the major leagues, and it became such a difficult sport to play on a daily basis. Is whether I was 4 for 4 or 0 for 4, you know, one of the things he would always tell me, and he never said anything about, you know, why just strike out three times or why are you playing so bad? Everything was always positive. And, uh, how are you mentally? How are you physically? Are you getting your work in? Are you doing the things you need to do? Are you being a good teammate? Are you being a good leader? And all of those things have uh, served me so well as a professional baseball player, but more so in my everyday life and as a, as a husband and a father. And I can certainly sit here today and, and say that there's not a day that goes by that I don't think about him since he's been gone. But more than that, you know, I know that he's kind of living through myself and my siblings and my mother on a daily basis. I am looking right now. He sent me, he photocopied just page after page of, he would write down when he would pitch. Here's one from Wednesday, May 16th, 1973. And he would write about, gave up a hit on an O2 pitch or whatever. So we, I think he looked back at his career and I guess he was obviously very analytic back then, keeping track of every time he pitched and what he did. Yeah, and, you know, for a guy like him that was mostly a, a reliever in his career, and, you know, when you look back at his actual numbers, they were pretty good. And he didn't come from a sports background by any means in his family, so it was probably something that he had to really work for at, at growing up just outside of Tampa and going to the University of Tampa. And Steve Garvey was a teammate of his, and I know that many times he said that, that just playing with Steve and seeing how great he was as a youth and as a high school kid and obviously going on to a baseball career, following those guys around and working with those guys and pitching to those guys and all of that was something that helped sharpen his skills because, like I said, he didn't he didn't have brothers. He had one sister. He, he had a father that worked for a phone company that was up on pole line sweating in Florida every single day of the year. And so he had to really breed himself into a baseball player. And I know talking to him, he wished he had gotten the opportunity to, to be a starter at one point. He was blocked in that 71 season in Baltimore by that great pitching staff they had there. But then it ended up being a, a blessing in disguise by after that being Rule 5 to the Montreal Expos and having a, a good career there and then bouncing around to a couple other clubs to round out his career in the mid-70s. You know, you talk about your upbringing with your dad and the realistic point of view he had about things. And you look at what's going on today with name, image, likeness. I mean, it's filtered down to college athletes and high school athletes. And where do you see this going? It's almost now like free agency. What do you see some of the pitfalls that's going on now with college athletics and high school athletics? Yeah, it's very interesting. I mean, I, I saw something online about the quarterback for San Francisco and what he's making and then what the quarterback at USC is making. And <laughs> you're thinking to yourself, this can't be right. But, you know, obviously everybody knows, especially in the, the major college football world, what the financials kind of look like. Uh, on one hand, you, you feel good that guys that maybe are helping universities make an inordinate amount of money are getting something, but you also feel like they're creating a system where the best players are not even considering going to middle-tier universities. And, you know, I can tell you in the baseball world, the amount of guys that I played with that went to JUCOs, that went to D3s, that went to D2s, that ended up being great Major League Baseball players, the list is really, really long. And, you know, it's kind of apples to oranges in certain aspects, but you'd love to see a way to, to maybe hold some of this money for some of these guys that are making it in college, but also not make it so simple as guys just jumping from teams the team, some sort of system where guys stay in, in one place and try to build programs.
programs a little bit more organically than what's going on in today's world. Travel ball also, many people say, well, you can be what you want to be in life, but you've got to have that raw talent. You obviously had it to play in the major leagues, but there are some kids, and there's nothing wrong with this, that are never going to make the major leagues. They, they don't have that raw talent. Are so many parents just not realistic about it? The one thing that I'm seeing with the, the youth sports world is that it's just getting younger and younger with the travel, with the amount of games kids are playing. And speaking from experience, and even though I, you know the 90s and the early 2000s were a much different time than now, I always felt like whatever season of the year it was was what I was going to play. You know, until I got to the point about my sophomore year of high school where I'm 15 years old, and I knew that I was going to excel in baseball at least in comparison to football and basketball, which were the other two sports I was playing. And so it wasn't until about that point where I really got serious with the travel ball and, and the showcases outside of the region to go run around and try to get in front of college coaches. With social media, it's a lot easier for kids to kind of get seen, but you have this feeling also when you're watching kids play, 13-year-old kids play 40 games in the middle of summer, you know, they're missing out on the social aspect. They're missing out on going to pool parties and they're missing out on things like that, which you just can't get back. It's when you turn 19, 20 years old and you're in college or, or you're working or whatever that may look like, you hate to hear about, you know, money grab type of thing. You know, with some of the stuff that I'm doing, just, the, you know, the, the Whippy Old Baseball Showcase that we started to run this, the past couple of years, we try to do our best to give as maybe not the high, high-end kids, but these kids that really want to go play at the next level, we want to try to get them in front of as many college coaches as they can. And, and last year, we did a really nice job. We had about 30, 40 coaches. A lot of them were back schools, Ohio University, and, and some of those. I just think it's so important to be a good self-evaluator and, and for parents to be good self-evaluators of where you are. And kids reach puberty at different times. You know, sometimes it's 11, sometimes it's 14. You, you never know. And I hate the thought of kids wanting to play Play maybe different sports in, in high school, we'll call it two sports or three sports, but they go to a high school that's so gigantic that, you know, one of the coaches says, hey, if you're not going to commit to me year round or at least half year round, we can't use you. And that kind of breaks my heart because it's how many of these kids, as you just mentioned, end up going to, to even play at a JUCO or at a D3 or at a major D1. The list is very small. So I wish there was some sort of shift in mindset, but at the end of the day, you don't see it slowing down. Because, you know, number one, a lot of these organizations are making money off of parents and, and pushing the rhetoric that you have to play all these games to be the best and you have to go to these showcases to get seen. And, and in reality, it's not necessarily like that. The cream will always rise to the top, in my opinion. But I do also think there's still a time and place for that. That's just kind of the, the world we live in, I guess, from a standpoint of parents want the most for the kids. Everybody understands that. But the self-evaluation is, is the one thing that I think the coaches and the, some of these organizations could probably do a better job of communicating, here's what we see your kid falling into. Maybe he should start looking at D3s. Maybe he should start doing some other sports, whatever that may be. And, and sometimes that's a hard lesson. You look back at the fact that you really, you had an entire life in about 10 or 15 years, and, and now you're doing something completely different. And my question is, it's so different being a professional athlete. You look back at that, how quickly it goes, and a lot of guys have a tough time adapting to life after baseball. Why do you think you were able to do that a lot easier? Yeah, well, you know, I think I had a, a realistic expectation when things were starting to, to slow down. I, I had a lot of conversations with my dad and with other guys that had transitioned out of the sport that had long careers. And, and I was fortunate enough to do well enough that I didn't necessarily have to get a, a nine to five when I hung up my cleats. But I also knew that, you know, I didn't necessarily want to play golf six days a week. I wanted to somewhat stay involved with baseball. And I remember having a conversation with a guy in the Pirates organization two years before I retired. He just mentioned, would you be interested in doing something on the broadcast side? And initially, my first thought was no. And then, you know, I said, I'll, I'll deal with this when I'm done. I didn't feel like I was close. And then things happened pretty quickly. And all of a sudden, two years later, you know, I'm reaching back out to him and saying, you know what, I, this might be something that I would be interested in. And, you know, there are teammates that I've had that you look at them and, and you think to yourself, oh, man, this guy, he's so invested in baseball. If it didn't work out for him, he's going to have a tough time transitioning into the next chapter of his life. And I never felt that way. I kind of kept a, a thought of, you know, this is amazing. I'm so fortunate to have played for as long as I did and done as well as I did. But I also know that I'm not just going to be sitting around only doing yard work or playing golf. I knew that I wanted to be involved in some capacity. And that's why I, I'm really enjoying what I'm doing now with the Pirate on the color side. And, you know, as my kids get older, maybe my role expands or maybe I transition into something else. I don't know. But for right now, I'm really happy that I did what I did toward the end of my baseball playing career and, and had those conversations about what's next. 
Bill Landrum, he had a great quote about the end of his career. I was tired of baseball and baseball was tired of me. And most people would think, wait a minute, you're tired of playing professional baseball. But he talked about the travel away from your family. And of course, baseball, as you get older, does get tired of you. Did you have that at times where, yeah, you loved it, but you understood his point of view? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I can remember. I think that one of the moments it it hit me that we were going down this road of not playing baseball anymore, and and like you mentioned, it's it's a two-way street. You know, you get a little tired of it, but it also, you start to see a lot of guys pass you by, and especially in a world when I retired a couple years ago, that the utility-type player was non-existent. It was more of a carousel of the AAA guys coming up, and maybe one of them does well or doesn't, then goes back down. But I can remember waking up after a late flight into, I think it was maybe Chicago, and you get into bed, and I remember waking up the next day and, and saying to myself, I have no idea what city I'm in. I had to literally look out the window to realize what city that I was in and that had never happened to me before. And so I know when that happened, I, I kind of did some internal thinking and that was probably about a year and a half before I hung them up. But I know that by the time that I was done, my body was telling me that it had had enough. My mind was telling me it had had enough. I certainly felt like it was time to get to the next chapter to spend a lot of time with my young family and maybe think about doing some other things. The final moments with Neil Walker. Neil, it's the changes in baseball, the, the universal designated hitter, pitch clock, shift what do you feel about the changes that have happened the last couple of years? I think that the pitch clock has really just tightened some things up, and, and especially coming from a, a broadcast standpoint, it's made things move a lot quicker. You know, trust me, players don't want to play a three-and-a-half-hour-plus game as much as the fans want to watch a three-and-a-half-hour-plus game. I think that has been good for baseball, just from the sheer fact of, you know, let's keep it going in between innings. You know, I don't love the throwover rules. I kind of feel like if you want to shift, you should be able to put any player that you want in any position that you want. That's just kind of my feelings. But the DH, especially coming from a position player standpoint, for me, that's an extra player on the roster that's getting an opportunity. A lot of purists will snark at that, and I certainly understand that. And I and trust me, I, I was an NL player for my entire career, except for one stop with the Yankees. So I enjoyed that side of the game, thinking your way through the game, especially the late innings with your bullpen and you know pinch hitters and things like that and defensive reports. Placements. I love that part of the game. I'm kind of torn with that part with the designated hitter part of the game, but I do think that, you know, adding that extra hitter, it seems to be it's kind of somewhat canceling it out. But of course, you know, you're also losing that, that late inning strategy that managers have to go through. So I think it's affecting the game from a managerial and a strategic standpoint more than it might be, you know, the actual outcomes of games or having that pitcher hit two, maybe three times a game and, and somewhat giving up that spot. But time will tell us that never changes, but I don't see that portion of the game changing anytime soon. The latest story you remember about your dad? When I was probably 10 years old, my siblings are all older than me, and my oldest brother at the time was 17, and my other brother was 15 or 16, and my sister was a little bit younger than, than my older brothers. But, you know, I was always the kid that was dragged around with my dad because he was coaching my brother's teams, and they were on the same, you know, Palomino teams, and I'll never forget being in Kitsky, an area kind of outside of the Pittsburgh area. And my dad had a game, and of course, I'm sitting there on the bench and, and being the bat boy and annoying everybody, and, and the game's about to start, and, and my dad realized, he only has eight players, and the coach says, "Oh, well, you know, don't worry about it. You got, you can play your, le- you know, your left fielder and right fielder and left center and right center." And, and my dad looked at the guy and he said, uh, "What if I send my son out there? He doesn't have a uniform on. Do you, you mind if he plays right field?" And I'm looking at him like, uh, "I don't even have baseball shoes on, a, a shirt on, or anything." And he said, "Ah, oh, you can go out there and play right field." And the coach of the team was like, "Well, it's, it's, you know, it's." it's your loss, so you want to throw them out there, go ahead. And I can remember I got a ball hit to me in right field, and there was a runner on first base, and the kid uh, that was on first base, the third base coach, is, she's waving him hard. She said, oh, he hit it to a 10-year-old. He, you know, he, there's no way he's going to throw you out. And I came up and threw a strike to third base and, and got him out. And, uh, you know, and, and my dad, he didn't even flinch. He, he, I don't even think he gave me a high five when I came in. He's just like, hey, you did your job, way to go. But I can remember that being a, a point in my life where I was like, hey, you know, maybe I'm pretty good at this game if I'm playing with a uh, guy six and seven and eight years older than me. But uh, that was something that I'll never forget because his, his belief in me, number one, not just in that sense, but his belief in me was, was always apparent from a very early age. And, and you know, there, there was nothing that, that he felt like me and my siblings couldn't accomplish. Well, once again, Neil, thanks a lot. I appreciate it. Now, you had 10 years of major league service, which makes you fully vested. Next year will be 20 years of interviews, and I'm starting to save my money up to be able to put you on the payroll. I'd appreciate that, Joe, yeah. (laughs) 
<laughs> All right, Joe, you got it. Thanks for having me on.